This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Has anyone ever tried to get your goat? To get your goat is an expression. It means to make you mad. A good friend might tell you, don't worry about what that person said. He was just trying to get your goat. But there are plenty of good reasons to get a goat and not just for milk or meat. The animals can help control weeds. They can be friendly with children and adults. And they can make money with their hair. Cashmere goats produce cashmere. Angora goats produce, no, not angora. Angora fiber comes from rabbits. Angora goats produce mohair. Mohair is used to make clothing, carpets, and other products. The goats came from the Anatolian plains. Their name comes from the Turkish city of Ankara. The Mohair Council of America says the first Angora goats arrived in the United States in 1849. Seven females and two males were imported. Today, the United States is one of the world's leading producers of mohair. The other top sources are South Africa and Turkey. 90% of the mohair from the United States comes from Texas. An adult Angora can produce as much as seven kilograms of hair each year. The value of the coat depends on the age, size, and condition of the goat. As Angoras get older, their hair becomes thicker and less valuable. The goats need their mother's milk for the first three or four months. They reach full maturity at about two years. But even then, they are smaller than most sheep and milk goats. Cashmere goats are usually larger than angoras. Cashmere goats can grow big enough to be kept with sheep and cattle. The outer hair of the animal is called guard hair. Behind it is the valuable material on a cashmere goat. Some farmers just comb their cashmere goats to remove the hair. But if the goats do get a haircut, it often happens that when they would naturally lose their winter coat between December and March. Angora goats generally get their hair cut twice a year in the spring and fall. Owners do it themselves or hire a professional shearer. An angora without a coat can get cold. So the sheared goat may need to be kept extra warm for about a month after shearing. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. To read, listen, and learn English with our stories about agriculture and other topics, go to voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find captioned videos of our programs at the VOA Learning English channel on YouTube. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Years ago, a young forester took an unusual new job. Earl Cooley became one of the first smoke jumpers. Smoke jumpers parachute from airplanes. They fight fires that crews cannot reach quickly or easily from the ground. Earl Cooley worked for the United States Forest Service, an agency of the Agriculture Department. The Forest Service had a plane that it wanted to use to drop water bombs onto wildfires. But that idea failed. So the agency decided to use the plane for what was then a new practice, smoke jumping. The first fire jump in the United States took place on July 12, 1940, 
in the Nez Perce National Forest in Idaho. Another smoke jumper, Rufus Robinson, went first. Then out came Earl Cooley. As he later described it, the plane was not much more than half a kilometer above the trees. The day was windy, and the jump was not as good as others he had made. He began to turn over in the air when his chute opened, and there were problems with the lines at first. But he chose a large spruce tree to land in near the fire and climbed down. With hand tools, he and Rufus Robinson threw dirt on the fire and dug a line to contain it so the flames would not spread. They worked through the night and had the fire controlled the next morning when other men arrived from a camp in the area. Earl Cooley always said he was not afraid being a smoke jumper. Over the years, he worked to develop the profession. He served as the first president of the National Smoke Jumper Association. He also wrote about his experiences. But not all had happy endings. On August 5, 1949, he was involved in a disaster at a forest fire near Helena, Montana. He had to choose where a crew would jump, but the wind changed and the fire grew unexpectedly, taking 13 lives. Many years later, Earl Cooley told a newspaper that he still believed he had made the best decision he could. He retired from the Forest Service in 1975 but he continued to visit the mountain where the men lost their lives until he could no longer make the climb. Earl Cooley died on November 9th in Missoula, Montana. He was 98 years old. Today, more than 270 men and women are smoke jumpers for the Forest Service. Smoke jumpers are also used in Russia and other countries. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. IKEA recently recalled frozen meatballs from its European stores after tests found some contained horse meat. Czech investigators said they found small amounts of horse meat in Swedish meatballs at an IKEA store in the Czech Republic. IKEA is the big Swedish company that sells furniture, but its stores also sell Swedish foods. The packaging said the meatballs contained beef and pork. IKEA said meatballs from the contaminated batch were sent to stores in some other European countries. They included Belgium, Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Greece, and the Netherlands. Recently, Laboratory tests found horse meat being sold as beef in a number of European Union countries. The EU law enforcement agency, Europol, is investigating the meat industry. Owen Patterson is the British Environment Secretary. He says the sale of horse meat as beef is unacceptable. He called it a fraud on the public. Millions of food items have been removed from stores, schools, and hospitals. No one has reported any health problems, and the French eat horse meat. But 
the situation has upset consumers across Europe. In Britain, horse meat was discovered in frozen meals sold by the Swedish-based frozen food company Findus. In France, an investigation has accused the French meat processing company Spangaro of knowingly selling horse meat as beef. The company denies the accusation. The EU requires the packaging of fresh meat to identify the country where it was produced. But in prepared meals, only the kind of meat used is required to be listed. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Pastoralism remains a way of life in East Africa. Herders travel from place to place in the dry, dusty deserts to find food and water for their animals. But some people think this movement of livestock is bad for the environment. They say pastoralists should settle on farms and grow their own food, especially in times of shortages. Not everyone agrees. Experts recently met in Nairobi to discuss what to do about food shortages caused by drought. They say pastoralists make the best use of resources. David Wongi at the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute says grasslands have time to recover. He says pastoralists have to leave an area as soon as the water is exhausted. They move to the next area that has water. It gives the area they left time to regenerate before they come back. Mr. Wongi says the land used for animals is often not good enough for farming, especially during droughts. He and other experts say pastoralism makes the most sense for dry and semi-dry lands. Jeff Hill directs policy for the Bureau of Food Aid at the United States Agency for International Development. He says arid and semi-arid lands represent about 80% of the Horn of Africa. Livestock-based economies in these areas provide up to 40% of agricultural production in Ethiopia and 50% in Kenya. And in Somalia, Mr. Hill says the percentage is even higher. In Somalia, livestock systems fuel the economy. An estimated 90% of the meat eaten in East Africa comes from pastoralist herds. Mr. Hill says Kenya and other governments have only recently recognized the value of arid and semi-arid lands. These lands have often been excluded from government planning and road building. Herders can face limited access to grazing and watering areas. Researcher David Wongi says communities need to be creative with the resources they have. He says a good example is a project in Kenya in which grass is grown in the desert to feed livestock. What would happen if we developed a system where we grow fodder and pasture along the river and the animals are taken off from the range and finished nearer to the market? What we need is a system, and that is what has been really lacking. He also says more efforts need to be put into raising camels. Camels are often the only animals that produce milk during a drought. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. 
East Africa's drought is the worst in 60 years. Scientists say the dry conditions in the Horn of Africa are at least partly the result of an event half a world away. The event is called La Nina, which means little girl in Spanish. A La Nina begins when waters become cooler than normal in the eastern Pacific Ocean near the equator. Changes in wind currents can then affect weather around the world. A related event, called an El Nino, happens when the waters become unusually warm. La Niñas and El Ninos happen about every three to five years. The latest La Niña began in July of last year and ended in May. The conditions can last for up to two years. Wasila Tiao studies Africa for the Climate Prediction Center at the National Weather Service in the United States. With the La Nina, Mr. Tiao says the easterly winds that are supposed to bring moisture into East Africa are reduced. And when that happens, rainfall is reduced. Starting late last year, rains that were supposed to fall over Somalia, southern Ethiopia, and northern Kenya failed. That part of the Horn of Africa has a second rainy season during March, April, and May. Mr. Tiao says that one failed too, but probably mostly due to the atmospheric conditions that prevailed at that time. He says La Nina conditions might begin again by the end of this year. And if that happens, he says then the October through December rainy season could again be drier than normal. Climate researcher Simon Mason at Columbia University in New York says East Africa has been getting drier over about the last 10 years. Mr. Mason says this is at least partly the result of global warming. Rising temperatures in the Indian Ocean create conditions that pull moisture away from East Africa. Claudia Ringler at the International Food Policy Research Institute also points to another issue. She said much of the land in the drought affected areas is not very productive even in good times. It will not get any better. Even if we have a bit more rainfall, the general potential for more food production is not expected to improve dramatically in the region. In the United States, the latest La Nina pushed moisture away from the south, causing severe droughts. Texas has suffered billions of dollars in agricultural losses. Changes in the winds push the rain toward northern states, causing floods. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. You can learn English and stay informed every day at voaspecialenglish.com. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Some countries have suspended imports of wheat from the United States. The suspensions were announced after an unapproved form of wheat was found in the state of Oregon. The crop was genetically engineered. An Oregon farmer recently discovered wheat in his field that survived the popular weed killer, Roundup. Roundup is made by the seed and chemical company Monsanto to destroy unwanted plants. The company has created genetically engineered corn, cotton, soybean, and canola crops that resist Roundup. 
Monsanto field tested Roundup resistant wheat, but it never sold the seeds. Michael Furco is with the United States Department of Agriculture. He says the wheat passed safety inspections. Monsanto ended its wheat project because buyers in Europe and Asia were concerned about the safety of genetically engineered crops. The discovery of unapproved wheat in Oregon led Japan and South Korea to temporarily suspend some imports. The United States is the world's largest wheat exporter, but American agriculture has difficulty competing against other countries because production costs are higher in the United States. Mark Welch is an agricultural economist at Texas A&M University. He says the incident could affect America's place in the world market. United States officials are working to identify the source of the genetically engineered wheat. There is no evidence yet that it has entered the food supply. The Department of Agriculture is working to make tests available to wheat buyers. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. About 800 million people in Africa, Asia, and South America eat cassava. The plant is a major source of food energy and a major food security crop. It can survive in poor soil and without much water. Also, the root can stay in the ground for as long as three years, so it can be harvested as needed. But in East Africa, the plant is under attack. Cassava brown streak disease is a more destructive form of cassava mosaic. The mosaic has been active in East Africa for about 100 years. It limits plant growth, but brown streak can destroy a crop. The virus was identified in Uganda in 2004 and has spread fast in areas extending from Lake Victoria. So far, brown streak has not jumped to Nigeria, the world's largest producer of cassava. But it threatens more than 30 million tons a year of production in East Africa. In some areas of Uganda, rates of brown streak reached more than 85% in 2005 and 2008. Claude Fouquet is a scientist at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. He says a few varieties of cassava can resist brown streak, but these are not the kinds Africans like. He is working to develop disease-resistant plants, but he says it will probably take five years. Loss of cassava crops could lead to hunger, and hunger can lead to migration and conflict. About $50 million is coming from the Gates Foundation, the Monsanto Fund, and the United States Agency for International Development. But Claude Fouquet says much more is needed to fight the disease. Brown streak can be hard to identify in the field. Irregular yellow spots may appear on lower leaves, but farmers sometimes do not find the disease until they cut open a cassava. If there is only a small amount of rot, 
the dead material can be cut away. But if the disease has progressed, the whole root is ruined. Scientists partly blame white flies for spreading the disease from plant to plant. Brown streak also spreads if farmers sell or give away cuttings of infected plants. Cassava has many food uses, but the plant is not safe to eat unless it is specially prepared. It must be processed through methods like boiling, grinding, or fermenting. A substance that can produce deadly levels of cyanide when eaten must be removed. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Pigweed is a weed that spreads fast and grows up to two meters tall. It can overpower cotton and other crops. It comes from the amaranth family and is also known as Palmer amaranth or Palmer's pigweed. A cultivated version of amaranth is grown for food and medicine in Africa and Asia. In the United States, some people buy amaranth as a gluten-free substitute for wheat flour. But wild pigweed is a big problem in cotton-growing states in the South. And now the plant is spreading into the Midwest. In many cases, the pigweed is killing genetically modified cotton and soybeans. For years, farmers could control it by spraying with Roundup or glyphosate made by Monsanto. But weed scientist William Curran at Pennsylvania State University says over the past three or four years, pigweed has become resistant to glyphosate. Now farmers in some areas can no longer depend on that popular herbicide alone to defend against pigweed. He says farmers can try other herbicides or they can mix another herbicide with Roundup and use the mixture when they would normally spray their fields. The reality is, even though we have this weed, this one weed that is resistant, there's still a lot of other weeds that Roundup still kills. Farmers in the American Northeast face a growing threat from another weed. Scientists call it horseweed. Farmers call it mare's tail. Like pigweed, this plant has also developed the ability to resist glyphosate. Professor Curran sees one major reason for this. Farmers are depending too much on individual products and not enough on different strategies to manage weeds. The question, he says, is how best to use a system of integrated pest management to control weeds. For example, IPM calls for farmers to rotate their crops instead of planting the same ones in the same soil year after year. Professor Curran says farmers should also consider planting cover crops. These crops are grown temporarily to protect the soil. For instance, planting rye in the fall can suppress horseweed. If you have winter rye out there occupying that space, it's very competitive and the horseweed is less successful in establishing. In the next two or three years, several companies expect to have new herbicides along with crops that can survive spraying with those chemicals. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. If you have a farm, tell us how you manage weeds. Share your comments at voaspecialenglish.com. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti.
This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. For many years, people in American cities have depended on farmers in rural areas to grow fruits and vegetables. But now, a new generation of farmers is planting crops in urban areas. Sean Conroe is a college student. Amber Banks is a teacher. They both grew up farming and gardening. Sean Conroe and Amber Banks wanted to start a farm in the middle of Seattle, Washington. Amber Banks says, there are a lot of neighborhoods that don't have access to healthy, fresh produce. And if they do, it can be very expensive. So we see unused space as a great place to grow food that will make it more accessible for people. Sean Conroe created a website to get volunteers and donations. Within a week, they were offered a plot of land between two houses. He says 20 volunteers worked for six weekends to turn the grassy land into a farm. They call their project Alley Cat Acres. He says they are growing spinach, onions, radish, lettuce, and chard that are ready to be harvested. There are also carrots, green onions, peas, beans, and turnips. And they are growing broccoli, tomatillos, cucumbers, and strawberries. The alley cats have harvested about 90 kilograms of produce so far. They have donated most of it to local food banks that feed hungry people in Seattle. Bridget Barney was sitting in the dirt picking lettuce. She is one of 80 people who are volunteering at this urban farm. Like a lot of the volunteers, she does not have much gardening experience. One of the goals of the urban farm is to show city people the joys of growing food. The alley cats invite school groups to the farm to help out. And Amber Banks says they want the same people who get food donations to learn how to work the soil. Sean Conroe says Alley Cat Acres is expanding to other areas of Seattle. He says his group would like to expand as much as possible where there is empty land that has good sunlight, access to water, and a community supporting the project. Seattle has declared 2010 the year of urban agriculture but the growth of these farms is limited. That is because Seattle, like a lot of other cities, has restrictions on urban farms. The city council is now considering changing those laws. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Support came from the Park Foundation, the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, and the Great Lakes Fishery Trust. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. In 1994, animal health experts started a worldwide campaign to end rinderpest. This disease is closely related to the measles virus, but it does not infect people. Yet for thousands of years, rinderpest has affected people by killing cattle and other animals and causing starvation. The last known outbreak of rinderpest took place in Kenya in 2001. Now, the World Organization for Animal Health is declaring victory against this much feared sickness. Official confirmation is not expected until May, when the organization will have reports from the last few countries. 
but the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has announced it is ending field operations against rinderpest. Jacques Duf is head of the FAO. He said rinderpest affected Africa, Asia, and Europe for thousands of years, caused widespread famine, and killed millions of animals, both domestic and wild. Experts believe rinderpest first came from Asia. The name means cattle plague in German. The disease was common in Europe until the 19th century. In Africa, in the 1800s, rinderpest killed eight out of ten infected cattle. Whole herds died, leaving people without meat or milk, and damaging economies. Rinderpest can spread quickly through the air and in water. Containing waste from animals with the virus, the disease was deadly in 80 to 90 percent of cases. It mainly sickened cattle and buffalo, but also other animals, including giraffes, yaks, and antelope. Some areas of the world escaped rinderpest. This was probably because of careful efforts. To prevent the import of sick animals, in 1999, Walter Plowright won the World Food Prize as a hero of the fight against rinderpest. The British researcher fought the disease in Africa in the 1950s and 60s. He led the development of a vaccine called TCRV. A single dose of it could protect animals against rinderpest. Food production increased. Now, rinderpest expert John Anderson calls the end of the disease the biggest achievement in veterinary history. Officials say they must still decide where to keep some of the virus and infected tissue for future research. Rinderpest is only the second disease ever declared to have been eliminated. The other disease is smallpox. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. The United Nations says in 2012, aid agencies. Treated a record number of children in the Sahel area of West Africa for severe acute malnutrition. The United Nations Children's Fund (UNICEF) says many of them were saved from the life-threatening condition. Severe food shortages and drought have increased malnutrition rates in the Sahel. UNICEF says about 850,000 children received emergency food aid and other medical treatment in 2012. The agency says undernourishment, which is a lack of important nutrients, is partly responsible for more than half of child deaths in the Sahel. Malnutrition increases the risk. That a child will suffer diseases like diarrhea or malaria. Felicite Chibindat is UNICEF's nutrition advisor for the Sahel. She says preventing malnutrition is very important during the first two years of a child's life. She says malnutrition can also affect a child's risk. Of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes, Felicite Chibindat says malnutrition has an economic effect as well. She says the World Bank estimates that the area's economic productivity lost two to three percent last year, 
because not enough was done to prevent malnutrition. UNICEF says malnutrition is more than not getting enough food. It is about not getting the right food, especially during the first two years. UNICEF is also urging mothers to breastfeed, and it supports efforts to guarantee clean drinking water. It is educating parents about the importance of feeding their children protein and vitamin-rich fruits and vegetables. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. Animal feed is the biggest cost for most cattle producers. In the United States, the cost of hay, grain, and other feed has risen sharply because of a drought. At the same time, wildfires this year burned more than 1 million hectares of North American rangeland. Jack Field raises cattle in the northwestern state of Washington. To save money, he made plans to transport his small herd of cows 300 kilometers away to feed on crop stubble. Crop stubble is what remains after crops have been harvested. Moving his cattle from farm to farm costs money and time, but he says if he can avoid feeding them hay, he can still make a profit. Tim Del Corto is a beef scientist at Oregon State University. He is working with ranchers and feedlot owners to help them find lower cost ways to feed cattle. He says cattle can eat things like grass seed straw and distiller's grains. These grains are left over from ethanol fuel production. He says cattle can also eat vegetables rejected by vegetable processing factories like green beans and carrots. Tim Del Corto says beef cattle can digest almost anything. The rising cost of feed has led agricultural research universities to give greater attention to what experts call feed efficiency. The University of Idaho has a cattle barn where sensors measure exactly how much food each cow eats. Professor Rod Hill says just because animals are growing at the same rate does not mean they eat the same amount of food. In fact, the difference in how efficiently their bodies turn feed into meat, fat, bone, and skin might be surprising. Rod Hill says ranchers can use selective breeding to get the same growth with less feed. But he says not to focus too much on one thing, like reducing fat. He says that while leaner beef cattle are more efficient, they produce less profitable meat. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Traditional fisheries may no longer be the world's most important provider of fish. A new United Nations report shows that fish farming or aquaculture may soon lead fish production. The Food and Agriculture Organization says aquaculture is growing by a rate of 6.6 percent a year. Aquaculture now produces 46 percent of the world's supply of fish. That represents a 43 percent increase from 2006. The report also said aquaculture earned more money in 2008 than traditional fisheries. The FAO headquarters in Rome published the document, 
state of the world's fisheries and aquaculture. In aquaculture, fish are raised in tanks or small bodies of water called ponds. They also are raised in cages or nets in oceans, lakes, and rivers. The report says increased aquaculture has helped people around the world eat record amounts of fish. The FAO says each person ate an average of almost 17 kilograms of fish last year. But the FAO says the current yearly wild fish harvest of 90 million tons shows no improvement. Decreasing numbers of fish and stronger catch limits have reduced the possibilities for catching wild fish. The FAO report says about 32 percent of world supplies are overfished, depleted, or recovering. It said these supplies of fish need to be urgently rebuilt. Some scientists have criticized aquaculture. They say the nets and cages permit fish diseases and pests to spread. Some aquaculture critics doubt that aquaculture can keep growing at the current rate. But Wally Stevens of the trade group Global Aquaculture Alliance says the industry must continue developing to feed growing populations. Mr. Stevens says a 100 percent increase in fish farming over 10 years is necessary to keep providing for people at the current level. He notes that aquaculture creates jobs and wealth, especially for people in coastal areas of China. The FAO reports that China remains the world's largest fish-producing nation. China produces more than 60 percent of the world's farmed fish. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. Our programs are online with transcripts and MP3 files at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. I'm Carolyn Prasuti with the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Food companies say a new kind of maize could take the crunch out of corn chips and other popular foods. The big Swiss company, Syngenta, genetically engineered the maize to contain an enzyme called alpha amylase. The company says this enzyme will help the crop produce more ethanol, a renewable fuel, while using less water and energy. Syngenta official Jack Burnens says the enzyme breaks the starch down into sugar, which is then fermented into ethanol. A 2007 law requires gasoline in the United States to contain renewable fuels. About 40 percent of America's corn crop is being used this year to make ethanol. The Department of Agriculture has approved the genetically modified maize without restrictions. But five major groups in the food industry say they are concerned that the new maize could enter the food supply. In a joint statement, they say the enzyme that breaks down starch could harm the taste of their products. For example, they say it might soften cereals and cause corn chips to lose their satisfying crunch. Mary Waters heads one of those food groups, the North American Millers Association. She says even a small amount of the maize could cause problems 
if it mixes with corn used to make food. Snack foods made with corn are a $6 billion industry in the United States. In 2001, genetically modified corn made by Syngenta was found in the food supply chain without approval. Syngenta paid a fine to the government. Jim McCarthy, president of the Snack Food Association, says the incident caused no health problems, but he says it did cause major disruptions in the availability of food grade corn. So his group is urging Syngenta to reconsider their plan. Syngenta says it will take measures to keep the new maize out of the food supply. Jack Burnens says the company will sell seeds only to farmers who take their crops to nearby ethanol processing plants. He says the company will not sell seed in areas where food makers get their maize. Mr. Burnens says the company has done a lot of research and found that the risk from a few kernels is overstated. The food industry groups object to conditions placed on companies that want to study that research. Syngenta says it has trade secrets to protect. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. Farm to Table is the name of a movement that encourages people to eat locally grown food. The Farm to Table idea has become more popular in recent years, but there is also a group that brings table to farm. This traveling group is called Outstanding in the Field. It says its mission is to reconnect people to the land and to honor local farmers by creating a restaurant without walls. Jim Denovan got the idea for this kind of culinary adventure, as he calls it, 10 years ago. He recently prepared tables for more than 100 people at Briar's Farmstead in Virginia. He and his eight-member crew arrived the night before. Chefs from a local restaurant prepared the dinner. Jim Denovan says, the mission of Outstanding in the Field is to bring people closer to where food comes from and hear the stories directly from the farmer. Jim Denovan's brother is a farmer and he himself is a former chef. He thought the idea of a meal served right at the farm made sense. So he traveled across the country and set up tables at farms and ranches. Guests bring their own plates to the meal and when they arrive, the farmer shows them around. Matt Sacheney and his family operate Briar's Farmstead. He hosted the Outstanding in the Field event. He says the event connects his family with a lot of enthusiastic people. It is a great way of forming relationships for the future. He says his type of small farm business thrives on relationships. Jim Denovan and his team have served almost 13,000 people. He plans to expand the operation. He says he is planning to go to Asia, Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and South America. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal.